All right. Thanks. Now, I've got some re recording equipment. I'm just going to set it up. Don't don't worry about it. Uh, this is to try to capture like audience questions, and this is a lavalier mic. But thanks for having me. Thanks for coming out on a Friday. Um, I want to get a, a little better sense of who I'm talking to, kind of what your experience is with Docs as Code. I was talking with Dave earlier, and he's very into this scene. He's got a lot of experience doing stuff with Jekyll and Swagger. And other people may be completely new and you're like, what is Docs Code or what is this stuff? So raise your hand if you are currently um, working in any kind of Docs Code sort of environment. So th four, four, okay. All right, and for how many people, uh, the, how, for how many people is this topic totally new? A few. So some other people have heard about it. Other people are into it. Other people uh, are completely new to it. Um, all right. So good. I'm just checking something here. Here's what we're going to talk about. <clears throat> all right. We've, we're going to talk about why why Docs' code is trending. And I'll of course define it and describe it. Scenarios where it works really well. Uh, so c some common tools, some challenges and pain points, uh, my experiences in implementing Docs' code at, at a couple of different companies, and then some reflections on maturity and momentum. Uh, we'll talk about APIs more in the workshop tomorrow if you're attending that. This is more like the, the publishing chain around developer documentation. And let's start off with a quote from Tom Preston Werner who is the co-founder, or was the co-founder of GitHub, <clears throat> he says, so let me set the scene real quick for a minute. He's in San Francisco, and he's blogging. He's got some kind of, I don't know how many blogs he has or why he's even blogging, but he's using these different content management systems, and he's having to update plugins and do other kinds of like database backups or security hardening, and he's just getting fed up with this, right? And this is, I, I'm. I'm sort of painting a picture of the origins of, of this movement. So he's fed up with these content management systems like WordPress, Drupal, Joomla, all these systems that are heavyweight, require a lot of maintenance and time and attention and are complicated and slow. So he says, on Sunday, October 19, I sat down in my San Francisco apartment with a glass of apple cider and a clear mind. After a period of reflection, I had an idea. While I'm not specifically trained as an author of prose, I am trained as an author of code. What would happen if I approached blogging from a software development perspective? And then he went on to kind of create Jekyll, one of the first static site generators, to do blogging just like a developer would. And he called this blogging like a hacker. Jekyll is one of the first static site generators, and there's been, there have been many that have followed. Uh, but this is sort of the origins, origins of this trend. Um, so the, the, the follow-up question that we might ask as technical writers is, what, if, what would happen if we approached software documentation from a software development perspective? Which seems very natural, right? Like, well, you're in software development. Why wouldn't you just do it like that, right? But that's not been the way that software documentation has been done. Um, and I'm not really just calling out attention to or calling attention to software documentation, but I wanted to pair it with the software development lifecycle here. Um, but yeah, the question is, why, why don't we follow similar practices as, as developers in the way we create and manage and publish documentation? And what would it look like? Um, and why would we want to do that? So this is, this is kind of how uh, Jekyll and these other static site generators work. Uh, they get rid of the database. In a traditional content management system, all the content is stored, is stored in a database, like a, a MySQL database. When a user goes to the page, uh, a call goes and um, gets the content from the database pulls it in and populates the page. So every time if you, if you go to a WordPress page, there's no content there until the page loads and then these calls go out to the database, get the content, pull it back. 
And people say, that's kind of crazy. Like, every time you're going to make this trip and go get all the data and bring it back, like, why don't you just build the page once, have the content there, it'll load a lot faster. Um, the other problem with these CMSs is that you can, you can log in from the cloud. If you go to any WordPress site and go to slash wp-login or dash admin, you can suddenly log in, which creates huge security risks, uh, which is why PHP is kind of banned in a lot of enterprises as well um, with the security risks. So it's slow, the security risks, it's complicated. You've got to manage a whole database. Um, static site generators try to get rid of all that. They say, let's build the content locally. We'll compile it like we compile a, uh, an application. And we'll deploy it using Git. And we'll store it as flat files. And it will, it will be much faster, more secure, lightweight, less management hassle. So it sort of started this trend. Um, and, and there's been a lot of development and activity in this space since then. And we've called it, we're calling this movement Docs as Code. Um, there's probably lots of other names, but Ann Gentle recently wrote a book and titled it like this, so it's sort of a, a good name for it. But basically, docs as code means you treat documentation like you would treat code. The same workflows that you would use with code, you would use with documentation, which um, is a new concept. It's, it's a disruptive innovation in, in our field. I'll talk more about that later. But here's what it involves. You're working in plain text files. Uh, it could be markdown, restructured text, ASCII, ASCII doc files. Um, you usually have a static site generator of some kind, which is kind of compiling all this stuff. Jekyll is one, Hugo, uh, there's hundreds of others. You use a text editor, such as Atom or Sublime Text or something, rather than uh, an official software GUI like a traditional help authoring tool that has its own interface. Um, you, you don't have to use any text editor at all. Um, you could open it up in Notepad, which I guess is a really simple text editor. Or you could even open it up in your terminal, I guess, with Vim. You use Git for file management. So if you're going to store files, back them up, collaborate on files, move them anywhere, you use Git or some other version control system, Mercurial or some other. Git is the most popular. Um, you publish continuously. So when you, when you use Git to push your content out to a repository, you have these little listeners in the repository that say, hey, I, I detect a change. I'm just going to build this content and uh, push out the output. So you don't, you don't have to worry about publishing anymore for the most part. And then you have some techie scripts that look to validate it, checking for links or um, terminology or some other stuff that you want to use to validate it. So um, you might use some of these as aspects. You might use them all. So it's not like you have to do everything to be considered a docs as code type workshop. You're implementing some elements of software programming type uh, tools and workflow. <clears throat> Questions, comments? By the way, I don't, I, I don't mean to postpone questions to the end. You can ask them at any time. Yes? Can you give us uh, an example of a validation script? Like what, would, what would that do? All right, so a, a very common one is to check for broken links. Um, you know, help authoring tools tend to do these validation things internally before you publish. But a lot of times with, uh, with this, these, this category of tools, you, they don't have that. So you might have a Python script that goes through and checks links on every page and gives you a report about what ones are broken. Um, but the validation is actually a great question because if you're working in Markdown, uh, it doesn't, you know, you could have a bunch of broken Markdown and not know. Whereas with XML, you can really validate and confirm that you've got ev everything correct. So there are some tools and services that actually plug right into GitHub. Uh, <clears throat> Travis CI is one that has a bunch of different validation that, that they do. Um, so yeah, that, that, there's probably a dozen different types of validation scripts that uh, you can dig into there. 
All right, let's uh, keep going in here. What, why has this trend started happening, right? Like for many years, technical writers had their own tools. We had, our, we had things nicely packaged with software vendors in our space who created tools that met our workflow that did reuse and PDF output and um, all kinds of component content management systems. We had our own world. But here's what started happening. Developers started writing. APIs started to be, become more common. Things get more specialized. We have SDKs to document and code tutorials and tech specs and very specialized information that requires specialists to write. And so we have developers coding. And are developers going to just use the tools that technical writers have been honing for 50 years? No, they're going to create their own. They're going to write their own. Um, you know, the, don't, don't underestimate the sort of confidence of a developer to just decide to build their own help authoring tool and system from scratch. Um, and this, is, this is why there are hundreds of static site generators, because a developer comes along and says, I want it to do X, and I can do it, and I'm going to do it. And then they push it out there, and then they move on later, and it's like, oh, huh, another, another tool. Um, in fact, this, this uh, site that Dave was mentioning, Doc Tool Hub, it really has a mind-boggling number of tools. There's 300 plus tools on there for all kinds of different things. It's really an interesting space. It's, it's a proliferation in this space. Um, for many years, the only developer tools were like Java Docs and Doxygen that would kind of look at code annotations in their, their programming source and build out a reference. Well, and those tools haven't changed for a decade. Um, but, but now they're building tools almost on a monthly basis. You see some new tool out there. And one will be overtaken by another relatively quickly. Jekyll, for example, is slowly being overtaken by Hugo. Um, and, and it's kind of a cool, cool thing to see this, this um, trend because it is really disrupting the tech writer space. Um, we can't, if you work in any kind of developer documentation, and you're going to want developers contributing, writing, integrating their content, working with you, you might want to use tools that will be more familiar with them. There was a, a talk that Riona McNamara, she's, I believe, I don't know where she's based. I think she's overseas somewhere. Um, anyway, Ireland, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> look, look, look at this. Um, she gave a talk a, a few years ago about how at Google, they had a bunch of internal documentation. And it was hard to find. People weren't contributing. It was kind of a mess. And one day, somebody came along and decided to implement a kind of Docsys code internal to each repository. So you had the programming code. And then you had the markdown files that related to that code right in the same repository. So you build the code, and, it's, it, and the documentation travels along in the same repo. Um, and somebody built a browser extension that would look and render that markdown in a nice display. She said it transformed the internal documentation for developers at Google pretty significantly. It had a lot of developers coming on board, suddenly writing documentation where they weren't before, and getting into this space because it was their language, it was their flow. Um, and that's why this is happening. So we, we've got these sort of two worlds. You've got the developers and all this tooling that's just building is this incredible momentum, complexity, and you know some of it works great, and some of it is half-baked. And you've got the traditional tech writing world with our RoboHelps and FrameMaker and Flare, and you know, it only works on a PC kind of stuff, um, develops or, or it renders into a tripane help. It's got its own closed box. You don't really know what, how it works or what goes on behind the scenes or even how the search works. It just sort of does what you bought, or it does what you you, it said it would do when you bought it. Um, and these two worlds are colliding. It's an interesting time. I mean, um, there hasn't been this much disruptive innovation in the tools space of TechCom for a long time. So here are some sites that are built using Docs' code. These ones actually are all Jekyll sites. I was compiling a list of these. But if you want to check these out later, uh, you can. There was even even the healthcare.gov, the part of it that was like the front end, not the back end database, um, was built using static site generator tools. Was that like yeah, yeah. I don't know what's happened since then, but yeah, they had a, it was a, you know, it was kind of like a, 
this move in the government, I believe, to use open source tooling as well. And so it sort of fit. But uh, for example, GitHub, their docs are, are built using Jekyll. And um, <clears throat> when I first started learning about this, I, I was actually uh, I was at, at a crossroads. I was using Dita and, or, or Oxygen XML with Dita. And some, somebody at GitHub uh, was using Jekyll. And people said, hey, you should check this out. So I asked him, and he's like, Oh, yeah, it's the, it's the bee's knees, he said. He was a super techie. He, he became like a developer there after a while. Um, but it sort of, sort of uh, I was looking to see how they did their docs and, and experimenting uh, based on how they did some of this stuff. It's interesting. So let's do a quick demo of how this sort of thing works. Um, and I'll pull open uh, just my API doc site. So this. If you are on my, my blog and you go to Learn API Doc, you see this website here, which has tutorials on API documentation and so forth. And this is powered by Jekyll. And this is the site. If I open it up in Atom Editor, let's make a change to <coughs> um, about the author or whatever. All right, so if I wanted to make a change here, I come in, I search for this page, and let me just say, you know, hello there. All right. First of all, I'm working in Atom Editor, but I could work in, in any of them. I've changed a file, and it's telling me that, hey, something has changed. I'm going to open up Terminal here. It's built in, but I could, use, uh, I could use an external editor as well. You probably can't read it, can you? There we go. So I'm first going to use git, and I'm going to add the change. Say, hey, go ahead and, and, and uh, track all these, these changes that I've made. And I'm going to make a commit message. Um, made a small change. And if I was collaborating with other people, at this point I would do a git pull and see what changes have been made to other parts of the doc. But since I'm the only one, I just push it uh, up to the GitHub repo. So now in GitHub, uh, if I go up here and I find my project, Learn API Docs, and I go up to Commits, uh, you can see that there's a little note that says, hey, this is what, what I changed. All right? And this orange circle means it's building the project. It's pending. And now it's done. So if I come up to this author page, and I refresh, and I bust the cache, and I wait longer. <laughs> it will. If it, it will say it. We'll give it a few minutes. But um, essentially, the building process is happening on the server, uh, not locally. Although I, if I were doing more edits, I would do it like a local build to see it. Um, but uh, GitHub has a nice integration with Jekyll, which is why a lot of people use it. it there we go. Hello there. So th this makes publishing super easy. Um, and I'll talk more about this later. But that's kind of essentially the flow of, of how it works in a very simple way. Uh, people transfer files through Git, render the publishing through these listeners. You work in text files, markdown format often. Um, you, you, everything's open source free. I put that in quotes because there's a time element of how much time you spend learning and developing and putting it all together. But Open source, uh, you can contribute back and so forth. OK, uh, let's keep going here. Top static site generators. There's a site called staticgen.com, which is uh, pretty amazing. If you go to the site, it indexes all of these static site generators. Somebody, I think it was Netlify who wants to uh, track this stuff. But uh, if, if you go to the site, you'll see that there are literally like 300 plus static site generators. And they rank them based on how many times they've been forked, downloaded, and otherwise kind of worked on here. So for example, uh, 33,000 people have starred Jekyll, which means um, you, you, while you're watching it, you go in and you, you kind of like star it so you can track the activity. Um, and how many times it's been forked and how many issues are against it. Fork means you, you make a copy of it because you want to start using it. 
and, and building to it. And um, if you go through here, there's tons of probably I've never heard of, right? Uh, for example, Hubpress. I've never even heard of that one. Phenomic. Um, Sphinx is down here. This is actually a, a one that is very popular in the doc community because read the docs is built around this. If you're part of write the docs, you know, this is the history of it. Uh, Eric Holscher and other developers were, were creating, they wanted to create a better way of doing documentation. They wanted to incorporate software development processes. They built read the docs as a way to do it, which essentially d did what I showed with Jekyll and GitHub. But on their own platform, they use Sphinx, Python scripting, and all this stuff. So all that's built on, on Sphinx, but you can also just run Sphinx alone. Um, but it's not, it's like 22 down from the top, partly because technical writing communities are always kind of niche communities. Uh, but you could keep going down here. Really, I would never implement something that has a really small community because it would probably just go away after a while. Um, but it's kind of fascinating to see how many tools are there that exist in this space. Questions, thoughts, comments? Okay. All right. Uh, complaints from the Ditta people. All right. So despite all this. Actually, I, I have a question. Okay. <laughs> so if I was working full time at a company and I convinced someone to use this, then I think, no, I really like Sphinx. And then a year later, it goes away. Yeah, well, this gets into some of the complaints part, and that's a great segue. The first one, no standards, right? Well, so a lot of these tools are, are they use Markdown as the primary format. Markdown, there's lots of different flavors. There's the, the original Markdown by John Group. Oh, it's totally escaping my mind. Gru Gruber? Anyway. Uh, the original Markdown, which doesn't have table formatting, people said, I want tables, and they created others like Multi Markdown, then GitHub uh, said, we really need like, code syntax highlighting, so you've got GitHub flavored Markdown, and you've got Cramdown, which is what Jekyll uses, which gives you other features, and there's uh, a few others that are popular as well. So uh, let's say that you have all your content in one system, and you're like, you know what, I hate Jekyll, I'm moving to Hugo. Well, um, uh, Hugo might use a different markdown system. Maybe it uses, I can't remember offhand what it uses, but let's say it used common mark instead of cram down. You might have some things that don't convert and you'd have to fix them. The bulk of it though uses the same syntax. You've got asterisks for bullets and so forth. But um, the other problem is developers use these tools because they want to be able to customize things. So let's say you wanted a custom workflow map or something, or you wanted some custom logic. Well, they often have scripting languages you can use. For example, Jekyll has Liquid. Hugo has Golang. Uh, Pelican has maybe Python. I don't really know what it has in there. Um, but they, they, they're based on different language sets that offer different scripting capabilities. So you say, I want this functionality, and I go and build the, all the scripting logic around it. And then when you want to change platforms, you've got to convert that scripting logic, which might be easy, might be hard, not really sure. But it's not like Ditto where once you have a set that's valid, that's standardized, you can plug it from fluid topics to uh, Oxygen XML. You just port it with a click. There's no, there's no question about, hey, does this, what do I have to do to convert it for the most part? So that is one of the complaints. Even among people who are passionate about like um, this workflow. For example, Eric Holscher, he's very passionate about his tools that he's building, right? He, he has a whole post about how that says, please don't use Markdown. <laughs> he's, he wants um, people to use restructured text because it's more, it's more semantic, it's more standard. There's not a million flavors. And so you can build tools around stuff that's standard, right? So there's, there's debates even um, within this community. There's not much semantics. Let's say you wanted to um, create a custom structure around your product that uh, would, would validate. Let's say you're building a, I don't know, maybe you've got some kind of machinery. Let's say you work in Germany, um, which is where 
Most people use XML systems with custom schemas that validate. You want to make sure that all your topics have this and that property and are formatted the same way. Well, you can't. There's no validation. Um, and there's no like semantic tagging within this. There is, however, a section at the top of every markdown page called front matter where you can put your own tags. So they can tag things at a topic level. But getting more granular with your semantics is, is often uh, just left to the realm of XML. Um, people will say it's, it's not really robust enough. Um, you want a, a lot of these tools, they're, very, they're kind of simple. They do one thing, the, what the developer wanted, and then that's it. For example, uh, PDF, let's say you, you need to create PDFs or you want to localize and you want to you know, push a button and do round trip localization into 10 different languages and push it back in. Uh, good luck trying to do that. It's hard. You can. There are hacks, and I'll talk more about that later, but you're really struggling. There are tools that are optimized for developers to do what developers wanted to do, which is usually just publish information on a web page in an automated way that explains their code, and that's it. So if you are a tech writer and you're like, well, I'm working with developers. I want to use their tools. I want to be buddy-buddy and you know, uh, understand their mentality and, and workflow and, and publishing a bunch of developer docs anyway. But then people say, oh, by the way, uh, Mr. Technical Writer, we, we will need PDF. We will need localization. We will need content reuse. Um, you have to really be creative. And I'll talk more about that. So now we get to the fun part. Two sort of studies. I, I've been at two different places where we implemented Docs as code. One was at Experian, which was, uh, I was at a startup that Experian bought. So I probably should not put Experian because it's a much larger company. But I, I was at a 40, uh, company called 41st Parameter in the Bay Area. And Experian bought them. Well, we had these requirements. First of all, they were, they were building content in Confluence behind a firewall. And they were using like uh, a plugin to export it into a PDF. And they're delivering PDFs to customers. The PDFs looked great. Um, but they realized, hey, we're a tech company and our, we're delivering PDFs. This looks bad. Um, you know, we want a modern, sexy website that looks you know, like, hey, we know what we're doing. We're part of Silicon Valley. We, we're on the frontier of the web, you know, whatever kind of illusions they might have. Um, so number one requirement, modern looking website. Um, second requirement, we've got C++ and a Java API and a, and a PHP API. And we want to segment out all this content for three different audiences. And like 80% of it's the same. But then you've got these differences in code samples and different steps. So you've got content reuse across different outputs that are segmented by audience. And then. Each release needs to capture and maintain a different version so that you, uh, the people who didn't upgrade still can access the docs related to that version. Oh, and by the way, all this is behind a firewall because you know, we don't want competitors to understand our product. Um, and so we're, we're going to make it so you have to apply some kind of authentication from Salesforce. And finally, we do need a, a PDF because we want uh, to enable our sales engineers to kind of distribute this to different people um, and pass it around a company. And a lot of them might not have Salesforce authentication credentials. So can we do this using, using Jekyll? All right. So I jumped into this. And we, we explored different solutions. At first, they were like, sky's the limit for budget. You know, choose whatever tool you want. And then you know, somehow that, that went away, um, I think, when we started calculating things out. And, and we said, let's do a pilot with Jekyll, which is always very deceptive, right? Let's do a pilot, because you, you can't really do a pilot unless you actually put a bunch of content in and sink in a bunch of time. So here's the first solution we did. Uh, use Bootstrap for the website. I'm not a web designer. I need to come up with a cool looking website. Bootstrap gives you ready-made components that look great in a responsive view, in a Regular view, so it's an easy way to build a website. Of course, it kind of looks cookie cutter, like, oh, they're using Bootstrap. But um, by and large, it looks good. And, and they've got an impressive amount of different components from like navigation tabs to 
uh, buttons to layouts, um, all well designed. Reuse across outputs. Uh, our strategy was to have each Jekyll project has like a configuration file where you can define different, different things, like maybe an audience. And then if you build your project, it will use those parameters stored in that configuration file. So by having separate configuration files, you can basically have different outputs that are tailored to different audiences. And audiences. Versioning, we didn't really have a solution. We just copied the files, and then when, the new, when it was time to work on the next version, we just you know, uh, left the other ones in an archive and started working new. I realized after a while that that wasn't going to scale because we had nine outputs times two when you include PDF. So with each release, there were like 18 uh, different file sets. And you do that about five or six times, and suddenly you've got a lot of files. Um, so uh, wasn't there long enough to see how bad that got, but um, that, that was something we could have improved on. The really tough part is when you, you're working on the next version and you realize in the previous version you had an error. You don't know if you need to go back and try to fix that or just leave it as is. Authentication via Salesforce was really the killer. Uh, the only way we could do this without purchasing one login, which was too expensive or, I don't know, not uh, sold to upper management, was to upload it into the site.com feature in Salesforce. So you take the output, you upload it in there, and it actually does apply it. It's kind of tricky, and it was very tedious, but it worked. And finally, for the PDF, we use something called Prince XML, which uh, does a great job at like, converting a page of content. We built a script that would grab all the pages, put them in the right order, and then feed it into this tool, which costs $500. Um, so this is the Jekyll doc theme I built for this, um, used different components, and I, I open sourced this, um, and it's been cloned a lot of times. I'll talk more about that later, forking, and why, why that might be important. Um, but it looked decent. I don't know if this is, would be considered like a you know, modern looking website that is, is selling the product, but it wasn't an embarrassment like the PDF. Um, all right, regrets. Regret. I spent a lot of time developing tooling. I think I probably spent, I probably spent at least a quarter of my time trying to figure out this tool situation. Um, and there were just three writers in our group, so it wasn't a huge efficiency for a lot of other people. Um, the Salesforce requirement meant we couldn't do continuous delivery where we have the server just build it because we needed uh, more integrating authentication is hard, right? And so unless you're, you have serious engineering involvement or third party to do it, it's, it's, it's kind of a, a showstopper. Um, I mentioned the problem with the file accumulation and versioning. And then the PDFs. Um, I felt that, like I should have given more pushback. Why, why are we really creating PDFs? Let's analyze the actual need because it's a lot of hassle to build a PDF every time. Not only the script to build it, but making sure that it actually looks right, that you don't have web components that aren't displaying well in PDF. Any thoughts, any comments? <laughs> All right, let's move on to number two. So after I left this company, because uh, uh, I actually really liked working there, but um, there's so many opportunities in the Bay Area, it's hard to stay, stay put. I had a list of like what I was going to do differently. And I was like, I'm not going to spend a bunch of time on tools. I'm going to like focus on content and I'm just going to, you know, minimize the tool time. But same problem. I get into uh, an app store group at Amazon, not part of like a well-established group that has tooling that's been kind of in production a long time. And we were in a bad spot because we were tied in this old CMS. It was called Hippo. Um, it was like WordPress, but built on Java. It's like, we got to get out of this. You know, we, it's same, as, same story as before, right? We're in a bad spot with tools. We need a better system. This is probably the case at almost any, any tech shop, right, in the doctor group. They hate their tools. They want better tools. Um, so this, these were the requirements here. We want 
to move to a new system, but we're going to have to still maintain the ability to publish to the old system while publishing to the new system. It's not going to be like a, a night-day cutover. This is going to be gradual, right? Because we've got a lot of content, a lot of authors who, you know, this is going to take time. So that's fun. It's kind of like driving down a highway while you're also laying down the pavement. <laughs> um, we want to integrate the design of the docs to look seamless with the website so that, so that it's one seamlessly branded experience. When you move from the blog to the forum to the docs, you're not going from one site to the next. Uh, we, we're going to publish through engineering because in order to have a cool domain like developer.amazon.com, you've got to have an internal tier one server managed by a proper you know, engineering team who can ensure security and uh, stability and kind of SLAs and so forth. We need to authenticate some content, but not all, uh, mostly around pre-release stuff. You have beta partners, you want to test stuff out, and you want to just show a few people content, but not others. We need to enable engineers as authors because we don't have you know, a budget to hire armies of tech writers. We're going to have to get engineering teams authoring. And finally, we, are, we, need, we need to support localization into at least three languages, Chinese, Japanese, German. All right, so these are, these are kind of like the reality. When you, you, you have these static site generators, generators that look fun and they look easy and it's, you know, you're getting going, engineers don't have these requirements, right? They've, or at least when they build these tools, a lot of times they don't have these requirements. Um, but, but tech writers, we're employed to, to take documentation to another level, usually. It's another level of complexity, which is why we're hired. And so we've got requirements like this. Um, and so uh, we looked at different systems, and uh, we implemented Jekyll again at this one. Uh, could have implemented another one, but this is the one that was most familiar. So to publish to both systems at once, we created different layout files that had different kind of uh, frames for the content, or not frames, but uh, different look and feel for the content based on where we were publishing it to, the old one or the new one. Uh, to add to this, the old system uh, required all the links to be absolute links, um, because that's what the CMS did, uh, whereas the new system, you needed relative links. So we made the links variables uh, that were kind of populated based on some logic in the configuration file. So that if you were publishing to the old, they would populate as absolute and so forth. Uh, <clears throat> to integrate into the website, we just output the body only, and engineers had a nifty process that would take this body and insert it into their own template where they could maintain the header and the footer separately. Uh, but of course, you know, styling the docs required us to develop our own styles. And so I namespaced them all within docs so they wouldn't conflict with the rest of the site because that was not easy. And then I used Bootstrap for a lot of them. Uh, publish through engineering, wait forever because engineers have higher priorities usually than building doc tools. Uh, so after about eight or nine months when they you know, had bandwidth, we got it prioritized and they built a pipeline to publish directly from an internal Git repository into uh, the, the server workflow. So this is the part where if you were using something like GitHub, you could just use the, the built-in sort of uh, publishing mechanisms they've got there. But our engineers, they understood the infrastructure and they built this and it worked quite well actually. There were hiccups, but I don't want to get into too much detail. Um, all right, authenticating some content. We also had this nifty A-B testing tool uh, internally built, which we had the engineers integrate. So part of, uh, part of the, the sort of neat thing about this tool set is that you can integrate it with other infrastructure internally. Whereas if you, had a, if you bought a third party tool that was a closed system, you often can't really make it work with your other infrastructure that you might want to leverage, like a, a custom whitelisting tool. Uh, enabling engineers as authors, this is actually trickier than it might seem, but um, we wanted to have them writing in branches, and then we'd maybe merge the branches in. If we trusted them, we'd let them kind of push it into 
the master branch and, and push it into production. Um, but we used the, the internal Git infrastructure available, uh, which all the other engineers were using. So they're used to it. It's a flow they understand. And then finally, localization. It's just a hack. We built little containers that would reference the HTML because, surprise, if you have Markdown uh, and you give it to a vendor, they may say they can work with it, but then they really can't. Um, uh, we tried. I did this extensive test where I sent them every conceivable Markdown formatting that we would use. And they, they passed the test. But what I didn't do is give them a file that had a mix of Markdown and HTML, like a table, an HTML table. It turns out that when you mix the two, they, they just melted down. So um, <laughs> we finally gave up. So we'd have to like build the output for language without any kind of layout send that HTML output to the translator. When that comes back, um, reincorporate it into the project. So clunky, cumbersome, but hey, if you don't, if you don't like send files out for, for translation that often, you could live with it. Um, and this, here's the theme I built here. I tried to make it look like AWS's styling on the sidebar. Um, and so forth. And I open sourced this, or I should say we, uh, open sourced this as well, but, but uh, not many people um, use it, in part because there's no instructions related to it. But I called it Jekyll Doc Project. Um, what was really challenging is that we had two teams, or we have two teams, and trying to figure out the right content architecture in this space is, was mind boggling. Um, at first, I thought you know every project, every product should have its own repository. It would give the people who are working on that content complete autonomy. They're not going to be overrun by visual clutter of all these other projects, um, and all these little tiny repos will feed into this system, this pipeline, and it will build. Well, uh, the engineers later, you know, little by little, were pushing back on that, and finally said, "Look, that's way too many." Like. Pipelines. It's not going to work. It's never going to maintain that. So we finally settled on two projects uh, for our two teams. One team worked in one repo. Another team would work in another repo. And the build pipeline would build them separately, grab the HTML output, merge them, check to see if there were any duplicates, put them through this process where they're stored on S3 and then stuffed into this template and deployed on the site. Um, so after we finished the Jekyll side, kind of engineering takes over and pushes it through the site. Um, but then what happens when team one wants to use content that team two has, or between the two? How do you get content shared across repositories? Well, you can't. You can build and you can kind of output content as a JSON file and store it somewhere, and another could pull it in with JavaScript, but who wants to really do that, right? So there are challenges in this space, and they're not easy to overcome. Um, this is what our doc site currently looks like. It's got like this nice header and footer that's maintained elsewhere. The body content just kind of gets pushed in there. Um, but uh, otherwise, you know, it's got this seamless branding. All right, regrets. Spent a lot of time developing tooling. Again. Yeah, I don't know how I escaped this. So. Um, I, uh, another problem, and this is a larger problem, is how do, you, how do you account for the time that you spend building documentation tools? Companies really want you to focus on content. They don't care about what tools you have. In fact, a lot of times they just think the tools are, are like a given or, or they're just there. Um, because you know the, it's so easy to publish on the web, tools must be easy too. Well, unless you have some kind of like resourcing in place to establish ownership over a documentation platform or some kind of, you know, hey, we're going we're gonna to dedicate this person as part of a tools team and that person is going to be funded. Uh, otherwise, you end up, you end up uh, with this strategy where it's like you build your tools on your own time <laughs> and you work on content on the company's time. And that's not a good strategy. Um, our localization workflow is cumbersome. It's kludgy. Uh, the two repo architecture uh, doesn't facilitate like easy sharing across, which fortunately we haven't really had to do. 
Jekyll starts to get slow as you add more pages. It's easy to fall in love with Jekyll because it's simple, it works. But when you start adding a thousand pages in there and your build time goes to a minute and a half, you, you, the honeymoon is over. Um, Hugo is much faster. It's a little more complicated though. Uh, so to get the logic you want. And finally, it's hard to prevent Git disasters. If you want to empower all these people to author, say, oh, you're our localization manager? Of course you can author in our system. And here's how you publish. You, or here's how you, you push it to mainline. You, you know, you're going to do this commit, and then you're going you're gonna to merge your branch, and it's all going to be good until one day somebody merges a bunch of sandbox content into production and can't figure out how to like untangle yourself from this Git nightmare, which just gets more and more complex as you try to get out of it. Um, <clears throat> It can, be, it can be a problem. So there's no real way to lock down these systems from that. Their appeal is that they're open. But that also means somebody can come in and make a mistake and break down the system or break the system. All right. I have a question. Yes. Does that mean that everybody that has access to your system is an admin? Because we do, I mean, I look at every single pull request that's made into the docs repo, and we edit them and merge them. But yeah. So your workflow is that you have like your your gatekeepers take pull requests to do the merging. Yeah. Yeah, and that is probably a, a better workflow. Um, I guess part of it comes back to uh, th that that should be a model really, but it depends how easy it is for your contributors to do pull requests. If you're using a company's internally internal Git system it may be harder to do a pull request than maybe it is from GitHub, which gives you almost a GUI to make changes and, and do pull requests. Um, and, and what about for the less technical people who also want to contribute? You know, the pull request workflow works pretty well for an engineer because that's their workflow. But let's say you have an administrative support person who is kind of in charge of a certain part of content. How do you let them plug into this super techie workflow, right? Oh, okay. This Angular Docs, it says like view and edit, and you click on that, and it takes you right to your GitHub, and then you can do a pull request from there. We've actually made a cheat sheet. Yeah. So when we did Hacktoberfest this year, we hosted a meetup and sent this around, and we had people from legal making pull requests, we had people from support making pull requests, like we had everybody in the company involved, and it was super awesome. But that meant we had seven months worth of work to review and merge. <laughs> so it was really great, but it was a lot of work for us. Yeah, so so I think GitHub's interface is great. I mean, they've they've improved it and refined it, and you you do see that edit on GitHub button a lot in Docs. Um, and if you just work in that kind of interface, it can be easy for a non-technical person to make the change. You remove that inter interface and just have internal, more complicated tools, and it becomes a lot more uh, or less practical to just have a non-technical person do a pull request, but. That's cool to hear that you work at SendGrid. Um, I think they were one of the examples of the doc sites that I had on there. Is it, I don't know, uh, there was a guy that I blogged a bit about it, Brandon something, or West, or somebody? He was, oh, okay. Yeah, he shared some stuff about the solution, and it seemed like they were a great example about how to do good docs, so. Um, but yeah, trying to figure out you know, what should the contributor workflow be? It's a challenge, and nobody's going to automatically do that. You have to figure out, well, should I try to use the workflow that engineers use, and they've got their own change request tools, or should I try to do something else? Um, it it's all goes into this first time, spend a, this first point, spend a lot of time developing tooling. All right, my overall thoughts um, <clears throat> on whether this is a good approach. I think you should definitely try to insist on third-party tooling, hosting, and deployment. There are lots of tools and great options. You know, GitHub is one of them, Net Netlify, Acrobatic. There's a whole class of tools built around hosting and doing continuous publishing for this exact doc set. And if you can somehow get your company on them, <clears throat> First of all, you, you won't be dependent on a slow engineering group. You won't be dependent on um, 
other kind of requirements that might be really stringent in, in ways that make it difficult. Um, you've got a, a company that's dedicated, that is there fixing things, they have SLAs. Cloud Cannon is one I wish I could use. Um, they, they call themselves the Cloud Headless CMS for Gia, Jekyll? I don't know what it is. They've got a new tagline, but they do all that. Um, Build, build tools yourself on own time, not good, right? If uh, somehow you're at a company and they don't want to give you any time to develop the tools, they want you entirely focused on content, but just expect the tools to be there, well, then this solution is going to sink a lot of time away. I mean, like, these tools, if you are the one developing them and you're not already tech savvy, it can be very intimidating and time consuming. The tools are incredibly flexible incredibly flexible if you have mad skills, right? If you are like, if you have access maybe to a web designer, they can do whatever they want because it's just HTML, CSS, JavaScript, really. I mean, you can put in whatever library you want, make it work, and build a beautiful site. But uh, again, you need some skills in order to do that. You have freedom to code whatever solution you want. It's unparalleled. Um, you can integrate these systems into these larger internal systems, like I was talking about with uh, the, the AB testing whitelisting mechanism and the, the, this internal templating tool and this infrastructure, the pipelines and all that. Uh, you, can, you can build what you need. You can write scripts to do the things that you need if you can write the scripts. Finally, um, I would say it's still very early in this space. And this gets me into the next little segment here. Um, the first telephone was kind of like a tin can. Uh, when Alexander Graham Bell came out with his first model of the telephone, it was a time when the telegraph was the main mode of communication. And the telephone was sort of laughed at. It was like as if you had two soup cans with a string and you were trying to like say, hey, this is going to replace the telegraph. People would look at you and say, you're, you're crazy. And it took them a while developing the telephone, getting it better and better, uh, but it was sort of simmering on the back end. It was, it was improving um, until one day, like overnight, the telegraph companies went out of business because the telephone was just superior. Um, there's a guy, Clay Christensen, who talks about these disruptive innovations. The, the ability for an innovation to disrupt an existing space similar to the way the telephone disrupted the communication space. And he has this graph, uh, if you can't read it here. We've got performance and time. Uh, at the high end of the market, your, your mainstream products, let's say your telegraph, or no, let's use a help authoring tool. Your, your help authoring tool, you're expected to have a certain performance. Oh yes, of course we can produce PDF and we can do content reuse. And yes, this plugs into our localization workflow. Whereas your low end of the market, your little static site generator tools, can't really do that stuff, but they're getting better. Right? It's like, oh, somebody finally made like a cool doc theme. Now we can use it without developing one ourselves and so forth. But uh, their performance, nobody really expects them to be a component content management system. Right? They can sort of squeak by. At some point, um, if you look at the progress that's happening, at the high end, the progress that, that you make in tools like Flare and RoboHelp and so forth are considered sustaining innovations. You know, they come out with a new feature in FrameMaker that will improve things a um, little bit, right? Lots of little feature improvements. Whereas the progress at the low end of the market is on a higher trajectory level. Um, things are getting much, much better with each release. Uh, things are plugging into more robust systems and they're getting more intelligent. Um, over time, at some point, the disruptive innovations progress will overtake the high end of the market and their progress. And at that point, the older tool, the older innovation will be replaced. It will be like everybody using telephone right here, right? And then you know, the modern day example is the smartphone versus the landline, right? At some point, landlines became this relic of uh, another time. So I like to think of uh, these tools as 
disruptive innovation that's still kind of down here somewhere. You know, it's, it's the localization, the PDF, some of the content reuse, it's not quite there yet. You're gonna have to be creative. It's gonna be challenging. You're gonna have kludges, but give it five years. Let's see what happens because developers are coding at a, at a fast pace. The web itself is moving much faster than the tech comm niche of the web, right? The tech comm tooling has such a small audience and small number of vendors. There's not that many people that are developing tools um, compared to the general web of developers that are building web tools. All right, another really fascinating part of this whole experience is social coding. The fact that so many of these systems are on GitHub and you can learn from them and clone them and fork them and build on top of them. This is called social coding. I, I talked about how my doc theme had been forked a number of times. This one I built while I was at Experian. Been, it's been forked 429 times. That means people have cloned it and built their own docs based on it. You don't know if they've actually done that, but they've at least forked it in their own repository, and, and more than that are, are watching it, um, which is actually an impressive number. And uh, a lot of times I'll, I'll check out a doc site, and I'll be like, hmm, this looks familiar. And I'll check out the code, and I'll be like, yep, that was my sidebar code. And they totally improved like the rest of the site. Um, and they put their, their, their uh, improvement on GitHub. So if I wanted to, I could clone their theme or I could port the content back into, into this original theme. Um, and you can learn from things. You can say, how is, how is, you know, how is SendGrid doing this cool little widget here? And you go click edit on GitHub and you, you can suddenly see the code and you download it and you're like, oh, and you get ideas and maybe you don't even fork it. You just like learn how they did it. Whereas the tech comm tooling that's traditional it's all black box. You don't, you don't see how it works, right? Even if, if you could see how it works, it would be completely confusing because it would be this huge jumble of code. Um, that might not be kind of, it might be sort of, uh, you know, more machine generated and processed. All right, so um, overall, I think it's very early in this space. Uh, it's an exciting space to be in because it is a disruptive innovation. I think in five to 10 years, you will see um, some of these tools mature in ways that just outpace a lot of the traditional tooling. Um, and, and it's a fun time and space to, to be in. It's not without challenges though, uh, and, and not without you know, a lot of time spent developing this kind of stuff. Any questions, thoughts, comments, sort of reach the end, yeah. Can you talk about how you do reviews? Wow, it's funny that you should ask that because I just had a, <laughs> A developer was criticizing the way we do reviews. Um, uh, I have found that people only review one page at a time, so or one or two pages at a time. So um, I currently push them out into a tool called WorkDocs, which is kind of like Google Docs, and they can comment in the margins, and um, it works pretty well. If I send out any more than that, it sort of overwhelms them. The process isn't ideal because I, I often generate a PDF of this content um, and people want to kind of, they want to sort of edit it in that space. In Work Docs, you could use other tools, Quip from Salesforce or if you have Google Docs. But I think that when you're developing the content, you can't be too worried about the format because things are in flux. So if you're going to be collaborating, you know, uh, just Put it in a space where you can make edits, and then when you're done, put it back in your system. But if you're just getting comments and so forth, um, yeah, I, I put one or two pages in a work doc space, and people make edits or make uh, comments in the margins. Do you feel comfortable sharing what the developer doesn't like about that? Oh, uh, sure. The developer said, um, so he wanted to maintain. He wanted to maintain the content in a in a collaborative space so that when people had edits, they could make an edit. And then he wanted to push a button that would just, you know, transform it back into the right format. He doesn't like this two instances, which is valid. It's just the tooling isn't really there. I tried using a tool called Beegit, B-E-E-G-I-T, -E -E which is a markdown hosting tool platform. Um, 
the idea was our docs are in Markdown. Let's put them in a site that has Markdown, it supports Markdown, Markdown formatting, lets people comment in the margins, and it will it'll work great. Well, it did not work great because people didn't feel comfortable going to a third party site to comment on stuff. I had to provision them, I had to you know, have licenses for them. Um, they're like, where am I? I'm not in Confluence. Uh, you know, can I even be here? Can you even use this site? Um, but it worked well as a review platform, like theoretically. <laughs> anyway, any other questions, thoughts? Yeah. Uh, with a lot of these tools, um, like a lot of organizations that I've worked in that have custom main software tools uh, might work beautifully, but every every quarter or so they run into huge issues with compatibility. Uh, their custom main tools don't work with their other custom main tools. And have you seen that problem with with documentation? So you've got custom-made tools that don't really interoperate across your enterprise. It's kind of like tribes with their own tools, and they don't sort of mesh together. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Things like if every organization develops their own thing, you know, it's like half a Yeah. A big mess. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I agree. Um, this is uh, probably a, a negative point against these tools, right? That you have one team who puts a lot of time and effort developing a solution that's custom fit to their needs, it can't really be easily extrapolated into another thing, and so that person sets about a different solution. And um, yeah, I think um, in some ways it's the trade-off, right? If you want to have a solution that's open and can be customized to fit a particular need, uh, well then you develop it yourself. If you want Stand, you want to plug into a standard tool set, you might not be able to change anything about it. Um, we, I ran into this situation. There was a different group at Amazon. Amazon's kind of tribal when it comes to the docs. There, there's lots of different doc groups, sort of like a lot of autonomous groups doing what they need to get things done. And you cut through the red tape that way because you, you can you be, you become more nimble. But this group was using a, an XML system. It was like an enterprise grade, and it was... Uh, well implemented, I think, um, but they wanted to do their own stuff. They're like, we feel constrained. We want to do what we want to do. I'm like, okay, uh, in order to do that, you're going to spend a lot of time developing your own tooling. You know, if you want to not have that time sink, you accept the constraints of that system. And this is why the third-party stuff is good and bad. If you were to go to Cloud Cannon and use like a theme there, or some other tool. Um, it may not, it may do things in a way that you, that's unacceptable or that's constraining. You go to readme.io readme and you're like, this is great, except for I hate this and that, but you can't change it. So this is the trade off. Anyway. I guess I was just wonder whether it's better to have on the resume, you know, um, very fluent with RoboHelp for two years, or I've got one year of this specific tool with this company. What makes the greatest impact on an employer with tools? The employer wants you to know their tools already. So <laughs> their greatest impact is that you somehow know their, magically know their tools before you get there. But no, there's this age old idea that, hey, I, I know like five tools, but not your tool. I could probably learn your tool, that kind of logic. But uh, you know, a, a lot of companies, they don't want you to they don't want you to know doc tools. They want you to know their technology. So they just like, doc tools, ah, that's a breeze. We want you to know like Java, because you're going to be documenting Java APIs or something, right? Um, unless it's the, the, the tech comm team that's hiring, and they're like, we hate our tool system. Help save us. You know, then, then it becomes much more relevant. How many people hate their existing tool chain and publishing system? <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> Only a, only a couple? Okay. Um, any other thoughts? Dana. So how do you enforce standards? And, or do you? Are, are you just like, okay, well, we're worried about the content. We don't really care if you're using heading one here or heading two or bullets. Or how, how do you enforce standards? So uh, 
that's actually something I'm working on. It's a great question, and, and there's not an easy way. Um, I think my approach is that I think every topic should have a standard set of metadata tags in the front matter, the, top, the part above all the markdown. You know, there's like three dashes at the top. You need to find the title, the link, the owner, the last time it was updated. Um, so my approach is to develop scripts that check all the pages for that, the right metadata there. Uh, as far as the rest of the formatting, yeah, I don't have a, there's not an easy way to look and see if like markdown formatting is broken anywhere. It just doesn't validate like XML. Um, if you have one technique that is used though, that is very, very good. Um, let's say you wanted to develop, let's come back to this workflow map. You want to have like some squares that show a process. Well, the, the actual code for that might be kind of long and bulky. So what a lot of these tools allow you to do is create kind of these templates that are called includes that, that accept parameters. So the person in the typing this just references the include, uh, specifies certain parameters, and then all that content gets populated behind the scenes in order to, to create the output. And that is a beautiful way of saying, uh, we're gonna do structured authoring, essentially, because you have a structure of certain parameters that are allowed that are then passed into a more complex thing. And the complex thing is handled behind the scenes. People aren't, you know, you don't have this huge chunk of JavaScript or CSS or something or, or HTML. And uh, it keeps it light and nimble. And the author, naturally, if, if you want this workflow map, are you going to like totally disregard this easy include that just has a few parameters? Or are you going to like copy the, all the code and try to like pull it in? No, you're not. So it's a way to hide complexity and enforce standards in a way that makes it easy. And, and that's probably, you know, from a, as a, the tools guy on our team, that's what I try to do. How can I make this as easy as possible, foolproof from screw-ups, um, or from, from, you know, uh, getting munged from whatever way that people would, would misuse it and abuse it, hide all that complexity and provide an easy include. But then you get more and more custom things like this, and then it becomes diff more difficult to transfer, right? So it's the trade-off again. It's like, well, I've got 17 custom includes, but now I hate Jekyll. I'm going to this other system. Well, now I have to go through all my content and places where it says include, you know, workflow map, uh, box equals whatever. I have to figure out how that translates in this new system. So you've got the, here the lack of standards is sort of biting you again. It's not like the DITA system where you just throw it from one platform to another. Yes? And you mentioned that one of your regrets was the difficulties to keep up with versioning of this documentation. And I wonder what solutions you think Docker's code offers to keeping up with versioning. Well, one solution that I think is uh, probably, probably a best practice is you, if you're using Git, you're already versioning your content with each commit. So usually people add tags in their Git history around releases. Uh, if you look at the open API specification and you want to revert to the 2.0 model instead of 3.0, they just point you to a certain snapshot in time in their history lock. I think that's probably the best practice, um, but maybe others have, have more. It, it sort of requires more Stricture, more, more uh, stringent rules around how you use your version control system, how you tag things. Uh, you can't just blow away your VCS all of a sudden and say, ah, we screwed it up. We're going to just create a new Git repo because then you've lost all your versions, right? So um, and it, part of the, uh, the challenge in keeping things simple with Git is that Git is super powerful and can get very complex, very easy. So uh, it's very, it's hard to say, well, what are we going to use with Git so that people don't mess it up and, and we, we keep it running smoothly? How can we keep it simple? Any other questions, thoughts? Dave? I have a question about, um, what do you think about, do, do you think that things like, like headless CMSs is our, and, and, a, and a static site generator are, Sort of the path that things are going, or is that just a way for 
technical writers and language people to try to get back control hmm. over some of the, <clears throat> the systems. Well, all right, so the question is, what, what are my thoughts around the direction of headless CMSs in terms of uh, control and so forth? So the headless CMS, just let me back up a step. This is where you define, it's almost like instead of working in an Atom text editor and being at the code level, it's almost like you're in a WordPress user interface. You can navigate your pages, it's visual, it's graphical, right? And, and this sort of um, user interface is usually like a client application rendered in the browser and it communicates with the files, uh, with APIs or some other, other mechanisms. So it doesn't, it's not actually like physically right on all your content. Um, and I think there's a real challenge, we were talking about this earlier, where you have non-technical people or less technical people, support, marketing, product, that want to author. And it becomes very difficult if you set up an engineering heavy tool set and workflow. Um, you can't just tell your, your marketing team, oh, just go do a get, uh, go do a get clone and you know, make your edits and do a pull. No, nah, they're gonna be like, what? Um, so people are trying to bridge this gap. How do we make these systems, these, these engineering systems uh, more friendly to uh, people who wanna edit? And I think um, in the long run, because engineers generally dislike writing, these headless CMS systems will win out because we do need other uh, groups to author. So yeah, I mean, it could be that this is just a blip on the evolution of tech and people say those were neat for a time, but you know what? They were engineers, an engineer's late night hobby. And uh, <laughs> what we really need is an enterprise friendly system for everybody. So who knows? Um, what was it that you meant by headless CMS? So if you go to a great example of this is Cloud Cannon. You can go and you've got a whole interface to work on your content. Mm -hmm. But your content is actually stored over in GitHub. It just sort of syncs it over. And it, it, the headless refers to the fact that you, you, you have a, an, a UI and it's not directly connected to a database. At least this is how I understand it. Maybe I'm misunderstanding it. There's a whole site about headless CMSs um, from that same, uh, that same staticgensite.com. Uh, uh, somewhere, the same people. Oh, there we go, headlesscms.org. Netlify, yeah, go ahead. Uh, no, no, they're not. They're not component content. Ma they're not content management systems. They're more like like browser-based editing tools. Okay. They give you a UI, a UI on top of this code. Uh, Netlify CMS is probably the best example. Um, Smashing Magazine, for example, they totally converted from WordPress over to this uh, static site generator tool with Hugo, but they needed. A friendlier interface, and so I believe they have Net Netlify CMS. It's great. It's probably it's the leading CMS product. Stand for, which has nothing to do with system. Well, it's the metaphor. I think it's like a different kind of content management system. <laughs> I think. Yeah. The, I think what I've seen at least it does is it gives you more of the structure. Like it, it might enforce a structure of like you have to have a heading in this article. And it has to have. You know, this section and this section. That's my Yeah, yeah. So the metaphor is they're controlling content by forcing structure? Yeah. <laughs> okay. I mean, it, it, it's actually a, be a great thing if you could force people to have a controlled list of options for different metadata tags. I, it's something I want. It's, <laughs> and this Netlify, <laughs> well, <laughs> this Netlify CMS um, basically is a wrapper that can go around a, a lot of different types of static site generators from Jekyll to Hugo to others. So that's kind of why they're leading the pack. Any other questions, thoughts, concerns, ideas? Yes, Jason. So besides Cloud Cannon and Netlify CMS, when you were talking about your overall thoughts, you listed off a number of tools. Did you have any other kind of in that top five range that you would want uh, us to kind of remember or go back and look, or, or should we be using these, these sites to try to find them? 
Uh, let me see. What did I say? Hold on. <laughs> I just okay. Um, it was back a while. Oh, it's been here overall ago. thoughts. Overall thoughts. Uh, yeah, you started going to third-party the tooling network. hosting deployment. Oh uh, yeah. You mentioned like Netlify. So the third-party tooling hosting deployment tools, like you listed off a bunch of them. Yeah. Like prolific note taker. I got almost everything, but I, I missed some of the nouns that you listed there. And um, well, I actually have, there's a whole other talk I gave on tools, uh, and I jump more into this. Okay. I think that in order to prevent spending tons of time developing tools, you should embrace a third party hosting tool. I would choose, of course, it depends what your company lets you do, right? But I would probably, um, I'm more thinking about the nonprofits I volunteer for that I'm going to get involved in this. Oh, okay. You know what I mean? Well, the company software, so I need to be able to do something open the, source and free. The combination of Jekyll and GitHub is pretty compelling yeah. because GitHub gives you the repository, their themes, and their community are the largest, and they're the longest established. But it's more specialized on or focused on general web sites, not necessarily documentation specific tooling and themes. But yeah. but it's a easy, simple way. You know, whether it scales to more enterprise needs is is another question. So is the answer just go read your blog? And no, no, it's just, I, I mean, yeah, I'll point you to this other, other site. I mean, having done two Jekyll implement, implementations at companies, um, I'm not in any kind of honeymoon phase about some of these tools. There are some serious challenges with them that if you have to create like heavy localization, you might not want to even consider this. Um, there's a great site if you, well, uh, readme.io is a great example of, of uh, hosted content. Okay. Um, Stoplight, I think, is a great example. This is one I'll talk about in the workshop tomorrow, but if you have APIs, they have a great solution. Um, and there's others, but uh, yeah. It, uh, I know Swagger comes up a lot with APIs, and I think that was mentioned. Yeah. Yeah, so that's kind of a... Um, Stoplight would allow you to host Swagger Maybe stuff there. Swagger. Yeah, okay. uh, m more you would refer to it as like the Open API description. Uh, Swagger is a is like a standalone framework that would well it refers to any kind of API tooling around it. But Swagger UI is a is a is a framework that would read the Open API description. And there's a lot of different platforms that will um, allow you to like will will read the Open API and display it. And Stoplight is one. Swagger Hub is one. And there's probably quite a few, but uh, uh, yeah, and there's free ones. Spectacle is one that's free, and, and so forth. Thanks. All right, I think it's getting late and certainly warm in here. But uh, <laughs> thanks, guys, and and if you have more questions, feel free to chat with me or email me. I'm happy to to engage with you and, and have more of a conversation. So thank you.